Hi everyone, thanks for listening. Today I'll be talking about apocalcemia and I'll be focusing on the symptoms or clinical features. Okay, if you haven't listened to apocalcemia part one of four, because this is part two of four, part one of four is all about causes. Please kindly pause this one and listen to part one of four then you can enjoy this. Okay, let's go. Apocalcemia clinical features will present with polyuria, polydipsia. That is why it's one of the differential diagnoses of diabetes insipidus or diabetes mellitus. We also present with nephrolytasis, that is kidney stone. I have made separate presentation on rena calculi or nephrolytosis or kidney stones. Please check my channel for that. I think I have about four of them. Also nephrocarcinosis, distal renal tubular acidosis, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, or acute kidney injury. Also part of the clinical features will be chronic kidney disease, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, constipation, pancreatitis, peptic other disease. Still on clinical features, we can have muscle weakness, bone pain, osteopenia, osteoporosis, decreased level of consciousness, confusion, fatigue, or stupor. Also, the individual could develop hypertension, Bradycardian, short QT syndrome, the opposite of long QT syndrome, depression, anxiety, cognitive impairment, and coma. So the clinical features will be based on the value of the ionized calcium. So it could be mined if we're dealing with anything less than 12 milligrams per DL or 3 millimoles per liter. In that case, it may be asymptomatic. But when we have a value greater than 40 milligrams per DL or 3.5 millimoles per liter, we can be dealing with lethargy, stupor, coma, or confusion. A value greater than that up to 15 mg per DL or 3 to 3.75 millimoles per liter could lead to a reversible fall in glomerular filtration rate by renal vessel constriction and natural resist induced volume contraction. Let me explain. Which means the glomerular filtration rate will drop, but it is reversible. Reversible because if we correct the upper calcemia level, then we'll get good kidney function back. The long-standing upper calcemia and upper calcurea can lead to calcification, degeneration, and necrosis of tubular cells. And that will lead to atrophy, fibrosis, and calcification. And we might be dealing with nephrocarcinosis, giving us renal insufficiency. On cardiovascular system, apocalcemia will give us short QT syndrome with arrhythmia and severely increased calcium level. ST elevation could show on EKG. And that may be a differential of myocardial infarction. So we have to take more history or run cardiac enzymes to be sure you are not dealing with myocardial infarction here. Calcium deposition is possible in heart valves, coronary arteries, and myocardial fibers. Of course, we know the implication of that. There's possibility of hypertension and cardiomyopathy. On musculoskeletal system, the individual will be having weakness, but the weakness could be mild or profound. 
there may be bone pain, and mostly in secondary to malignancy or hyperparathyroidism. We have to carry out our physical examination, and at that level, we may not pick anything specific. So, apacalcemia may be non specific when it comes to physical examination. And we might pick features of the underlying pathology, for example, features of malignancy. We can have band keratopathy, and that will be picked through sweet lamp examination with calcium deposition in cornea. And that will appear like horizontal band across the cornea. And with that, I've come to the end of apacalcemia part two of four, centered around symptoms only. Remember, you need to listen to part one, that is all about causes. And part three, will be a bad diagnosis. Thanks for listening. Please remember to subscribe and share. Thanks, I appreciate it.